with Professor Tom. Uh, my name is Yukti and I will be your moderator today. One of my main jobs at Single Store is to organize weekly AI webinars. We organize two or three webinars per week, depending on the trend. Uh, we demonstrate data and AI use cases and new tools and technologies. Uh, I also post about our upcoming webinars every week. So if any of these topics are interesting to you, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. You can stay in the loop. And also I'd like to hear your feedback or ideas or any suggestions that you guys have on future topics that you'd like to see. Um, so if I speak of future sessions, we've got amazing sessions coming up that you can see on your screen. Uh, on May 17th, we have GPT-40 for developers, hands-on with OpenAI Spring release. This was a last minute edition and is one of the most in-demand webinars that we currently have. It's a must attend for you guys. And on May 20th, we have how to build local LLMs uh, with Olama and single store for Mac security. We have Akmal as the speaker who is also there in the webinar today. And on May 22nd, we have LLMs in fraud detection, uh, which is also a very good topic for any of you guys, those who are working in this kind of industry. So if any of these topics are interesting to you, please RSVP right now. I hope to see you guys there. Also in the slide, you might notice that we now have an auto RSVP future, uh, RS, auto RSVP to future AI webinars option on our website. So if you guys visit any of these landing, let, let me just uh, pass the mic to Akmal first to talk about single store for a bit and then we can get started. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you, Yukti. And uh, thank you all very much for joining wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we know your time is valuable, so thank you very much. And uh, I'll do my usual two slides of single store, and that's it. And then I'll step down, and uh, I'll be there in helping out with the uh, Q and A. Okay, so we'll do our very best to uh, um, help out with that. So basically, one slide on the company and uh, where it is, where it started, and where we are at the moment. So historically, started way back in 2011, as you can see. Here we are all the way to 2024 now. And so during that period of time, revenue is now at uh, over 100 million ARR and over 350 customers. And you can see these kind of inflection points there. So between 2017, 2018, really, that's when the revenue started to grow significantly. And uh, here between 2019, 2020, number of customers started to grow significantly. And in terms of investors, you can see right down at the bottom there, some very well-known uh, names, global names there that you can uh, probably recognize some of those there. Okay. So some milestones there as well shown, but um, we'll talk about more of those uh, for the webinars that uh, Yukti mentioned next week. Uh, we'll have more time to discuss that. Really want to uh, uh, hand over to Tom. And then I'll just show this which is again, a nice kind of architectural view of what single store is. It is a database management system and a data platform now. Uh, so its roots are in relational technology, originally started off as purely in memory. Okay, it used to be known as MemSQL. You may have come across the product and the technology formerly known as MemSQL, focusing purely on OLTP, subsequently added support for analytics and OLAP capability and has this kind of universal storage that can handle both types of uh, data now. Uh, we integrate with a wide variety of uh, platforms. We've In the recent past, we've covered Kafka, for example. You may have attended one of my webinars a few weeks back there, and we've done Spark as well, and uh, other technologies, Hadoop, HDFS, S3, and you can consume the data from these uh, sources in parallel at scale using this uh, pipelines feature. So we uh, work with all the three major cloud platforms in the Western world, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft, Azure. Yeah, you can also run us on-prem if you wish. There's a Docker container as well if you want to try it out. But uh, seriously, um, you can, we'll post the link in the chat. Okay, I recommend sign up. You know, in the cloud, in your browser is probably the easiest way. Nothing to install locally, and you'll get access to the environment and the free tier uh, as well, which we'll uh, talk about more next week. Uh, support for relational, obviously, uh, but also things like geospatial, okay, which we've again covered in the past time series, which we did uh, uh, a, a couple of months back there. Uh, we have JSON support as well, key value, and vectors, okay, which uh, Tom covered in his previous uh, webinar, you know, by hand, that uh, we had his uh, the, the pleasure of uh, having him uh, teach us that and give us the insights on that. 
Um, finally, just real-time decisions, AI apps, dynamic experiences, and uh, you can create dashboards and it will work with your favorite technologies. If you use Tableau, for example, I like MetaBase simply because there's a free version. It's just a jar file. And then within about two or three minutes, it can be easily connected to single store and I could be building some uh, nice visual, you know, pie charts, graphs, uh, and so on. And so overall, you can see this is the, uh, you know, the nice kind of big picture that shows you some of the features and capabilities of the technology. One small point before I hand over to Tom, sometimes you get asked the question, um, you know, how is single store different to uh, vector databases such as Pinecone, uh, Weaviet, you know, Chroma DB and so on. And hopefully you can see with all its capabilities here, typically in an enterprise environment, if you want to do more than just vectors, I mean, you can use single store purely as a vector database if you want to. And vector support has been there since 2017. Got better earlier this year, more capabilities, indexing and so on. Some cool features were added, but there's more than meets the eye here, as you can see. There's a whole range of capabilities, which typically, if you're working in an enterprise environment, you are likely to need, and therefore you can do far more than just a pure vector database, okay? And with that, I will now stop sharing, okay? And hand over to Tom. And so you and I will be there with the uh, Q&A. And so let me just, uh... okay, there we go. Just bear with me. And... Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. It is 10 o'clock at where I am. I'm in Los Angeles. And many of you might know I'm actually based in Denver, Colorado. And I'm here to attend the International Science and Engineering Fair. So a bunch of high school presenting their science projects. I'm, I'm just one of the judges. So last week, uh, last night, there was the free trip to Universal Studio that I had to give up to make sure I'm fully prepared for today's talk. So I'm putting a lot of effort and time into preparing today's presentation about RAG. And last time I gave a lecture on vector databases using my method of by hand exercises and many people found value in that kind of style. So today I would like to share with you my version of Rack, Beginner's Guide to Rack, following a similar style and with a little bit more hands-on um, in interactive stuff. And with that, and I'm going to share my screen. That is my slide, Beginner's Guide to Rack. And I want to make sure everything works. So I'm going to write something. Hello, everybody. Okay, hopefully you can see it on the screen share. And then one thing I like to try to do today that I didn't do last time is that I won't like actually set up the extra camera here for you to see how I'm writing this in real time as well. I hope that could be fun for you to be able to see both. All right. Uh, and because of the nature of the way that I'm presenting, and I would like to encourage you to download the slides. I usually share my blank slides for students to download and they could follow along as I presenting the materials. So you can go to this link by dash hand.ai slash rack, and you'll be able to find a download link to get a blank slides. You could load it onto your tablet to follow along, or you can keep it and you have a printer next to you. You can print them and follow them anyway. This is the roadmap for today. I would like to share with you this mathematical equation I come up with to describe what I think a rag is. And then afterward, I talk about some prompt that implemented this equation and the way that we can index data that in order to search and be provide context for the for the uh the retrieval part of rag and then indexing that involve the process, a pipeline of loading data, splitting data into chunks, embedding each chunk into vectors and storing those vectors into a database. And then with that, how can we then retrieve those uh, information from the database? And so if you have time, they will go through some advanced rack techniques, even though it's beginner's guide, but we're going to use the kind of a very intuitive overview of some of the advanced technique. And, and then, question answering. So that is our roadmap. 
First, we we'll start with math, but not really a scary math. It's a very simple equation I come up with that reg, uh, in my opinion, is query plus prompt plus plus context and plus large language model. And what does it really what does it mean? So first, we'll start with a query, just with a query. And normally, we'll send this query to large language model. We like to get some results for the users, and for but then, and then I will do something like, oh, well, I will add query into this template. Instead of sending it, I would like to have a template adding something more to the query. So first is query. And now I and then add some prompt around it. I'm going to cover prompt a little bit. But then I would like to be able to add some context, add context to the query. So context could come from the database. For instance, I can take this question, how much does Tom make? And go to the database and and we use this information, we retrieve a database, a bunch of data here. So actually only three rows, but it could potentially be more. And then because of the query, this row seems to be most relevant to our query. And then the database will retrieve this and add it into our prompt template. So we have Tom, 50 and prof added to this template. And question would be, if I just write it, it will be how much does Tom make? They'll be add, inserted into the template. And then, and then let, lastly, we'll add some kind of prompt engineering around it. So this is a prompt I actually like to walk you through this prompt. I added some blank for us to fill out so you can see how this prompt works. So in this prompt, I would like to say, tell the logic model you are uh, something or respectful, something assistant. So something, some adjective. What would be the good adjective to add? First, or maybe I want the, I want to be helpful. So I want, please be helpful. Be respectful. And what else do we do we want? Uh we want or do can you be honest? So these are the example how you want the language model to behave. And also your answer should not include something that maybe on the negative side. What you should be helpful, but you also should not say something harmful. You should not say something um unethical, for instance, unethical. And you should you shouldn't be saying something racist, sexist, toxic, dangerous, and so on, blah blah blah. And then the and your responses are socially, socially unbiased. Yeah, I want to you want to I don't want you to be biased. So you want to be unbiased. So this is like a prompt we added to the original query. The query just how originally was just how much does Tom make? And with this rag, we add, we augment this query with prompt, we augment this query with context, and then we add it to send it to large storage model. Eventually, we then we send this to the whole thing, not just a query. Now we have augmented with a context coming from the database. We augmented with a prompt that that specify how you like to large language model to behave. And then we feed all this information to the large language model, and has now has a lot of information. Maybe they will be saying something like, "Well, the answer to how much does tongue make is." 50, well, it's actually, actually not much. So a little bit something, something like that. And then it's kind of humorous in this case. Uh, well, not much. Well, compared to CEO and CTO. Anyway, as a professor, not making that much. So a lot of model has all this information to answer the question. So that's what I think the rag could be catch, uh, conceptualized in very simple equation. Rag, query equals query plus prompt plus context crop L M M. And for the rest of this presentation, I'll let you just break down, take some deep dive to, to take you further into some of these components. And so what if we remove something from a question? If we don't have this prompt, we just like have adding context, what's gonna happen is that, well, if we still take this query to populate this template with our question, and then we could still do retrieval to get the context we want using this query to retrieve the context, the data we want and put it into the context, but we didn't really add any extra prompt. And the result could be something like you add three to the LAM, 
but LA might not behave the way it wants. Maybe what if you who could be something like, oh, what you could say something like, oh, you are poor, ha ha ha. So that of get LM is not that nice, right? Not that helpful. So it's that it's just a very simple conceptual example to show you how important it is to add some extra prompt around it for it to get the LN to behave in the way you want. Okay? Hopefully that. And what if we take even more stuff out? They just don't have context, just query L. Actually going back to, this is just original LM without rack. So we just query. So if you would just add this query to LM, just add the query to LM directly, what would LM say in this case? So one way they could say something like, $25 million. That actually made me happy. Why are you saying $25 million? Why is hallucinating? It's, so we use the word hallucinate to describe this situation when LM is saying something that just doesn't match reality. And in reality, I'm only making like much less than this. So think about it. You can type in the chat. Why would LM say, how much does Tom make? Why would it say $25 million? Let me see whether anyone for something reasonable say. So, there, so the hint is that there's someone who's also by the name Tom who's much famous than myself, who's making a lot more money. Okay, so that is what for you to think about. So without the augmenting your query with a context, it will probably just make the most educated guess. And by searching the internet with Tom, how much Tom make, the most likely you will it will bring up information about Tom Cruise, who is making $25 million, making Mission Impossible. And they will use this information to provide your answers. So anyway, this is a way that I'm trying to go from RAG and, and going back to when we didn't have RAG, we only have logical model, how it might hallucinate. And there's another way of saying that one of the original motivation for us to use rack is to deal with the problem with hallucination. The logical model answering questions just based on the training that it has received. And with rack, we augment with the data we want the logical model to focus on. In this simple case, is that database of our own data. So that's the spirit of rack. And so in next section, I would like to show you a few more examples of prompting. And the example I just showed you is about question answering. And if we would just add a bit more stuff to the prompt, we can get rack to serve other applications. So I'm going to go through some simple one. So for instance, we'd like the rack to summarize information and it will just change the raw prompt very slightly and to achieve the purpose. And this is the actual prompt that I got from GitHub from Llama index. So that's how exactly how you implement rack that's to support various applications. So by so for instance to summarize, in order to summarize, so we'll write something like context information from instead of just one source, you have multiple sources. So have lots of stuff. So context it's should it be multiple documents. Each document can be really long. So it's a huge text block speak added here. So multiple sources is below and given the information from multiple sources below and not something. So answer the query, why would you put it here? So not something we want to prevent the large, long, large language model from hallucinating or adding something not relevant is that we won't say, no, not, please don't add any prior knowledge. So we'll ask not language model not to rely on some of the training that I said you might have seen. Don't pay attention to how, how much Tom Cruise made, for instance. So we'll summarize all this text in this context string, and then query string will be coming from the user interface maybe and come up with the answer. And this thing go to large, goes to large language model. Give you an idea. So that is one example. And there's another simple example is how about uh, choosing a single choice question, get lost to the model in the, using rack to answer a single choice question. What would the template, prompt template looks like? So some choices are given below. It is provided in a number list, one to a number of chunks. So maybe there could be 100 chunks. We'll talk about how those chunks are. For each item in the list correspond to a summary. So we'll use database to retreat a list of contexts. It'll be one, blah, two, blah, three, blah, and fill out the template over here. And using only the choices about 
And not prior knowledge, go see this one more time, not prior knowledge. So design leaders, pump engineering, this seem to be important for, to prevent LLM, to help L to tell LLM to focus, focus on what I want you to focus on, which is my data, not prior knowledge. So then we turn the choice that is most relevant to the question above, and then query string comes from our user interface and provide choice in the following format, answer number, and explain why that's sometimes for choice, we'd like to then explain why the choice was selected in relation to the question. And there's a some, one kind of technique that when you actually ask large language model explain, it could, that is called, they will, then sometimes, oftentimes large language model will engage in chain of thought and they will actually do a better job. Knowing that you have explained this, it will force the language model to actually go through the reasoning to pick the choice. So this is turns out to be quite effective to add another explain why this choice was selected in at the end of your prompt. So, and then, Okay, the one, just one more example, but there's uh, many, many other examples. They just give you a sense of taking you through how you would, if you ever have to design your rack, design the prompt, this the process that you'll go through. Just come up with this prompt, but I just take you slowly here. So refine, the original query is as follow query, but we have provided an existing answer. In this case, we're not asking last model generate a new stuff. We have actually quite an answer maybe from our database, but we want last language model to refine it. So we have the opportunity to, to refine. So we tell the last language model to refine the existing answer with some more context below. This comes from the database and give the new context, refine the original answer to better answer the query. If the context isn't useful, return, just return the original answer. You don't have to refine. You could just keep the original answer and the refine answer and send all this to last language model to continue to refine, to provide the refine answer. So I show you three other app, four applications, the QA, summarize, single choice, and refinement. There's a lot of other applications, but finally the similar process when you design RAG, you have you would design this kind of prompt. And then you add those prompt to the context you retrieve from the database, and then you add them together to your query as an logic model to provide behavior you want. So that is how the prompt part of the, this right equation. All right, hopefully that's helpful. And now we we'll to take a deep dive into how the context work. How do we actually get context information? So it comes from database. And before we could even have anything in the database, we have to index, build an index. And that, so the index process, I want to go through the index process. They follow a four major step, which is to load, split, and embed, and store. And then I would like to surprise you with a Chinese lesson. So you have to learn the Chinese character from me. I'm just kidding. No. So the reason why I like to use Chinese because that to to convey to you that this process is actually agnostic to languages. It could if you work for Chinese, it work for other languages, it work for English as well. So not just it's not the English only process. And so first load is that we would like to load a lot of documents into our pipeline. So it comes from your proprietary database or use SQL or somewhere, then you would like to load a store index in a way that you could support your rack. So in this case, those are those three documents and it could be potentially more. And I make a mistake, this should be a unique ID. So maybe ID three, ID four. So this is the, the properties of metadata for document. And these characters are the content of the document. And then split is that we like to break this document into chunks. So the for the document two and three that's already done, you can see that you can kind of tell how many tokens are there in each chunk, right? You don't even have to understand any of the character, but you can just count as three, three. So okay, chunk size kind of three. So we chunk size three, so it's kind of like this three and this another three, another three, another three, and it'll fill this up into the chunk. So I actually I'm gonna so be like this. So first chunk will be the three first character, second chunk, and the second chunk, a third chunk is this. And then that is this. So it's, you don't really have to understand what these characters mean, but you can see the process, how a paragraph broken into chunk of the same length, three in this case, but it could be more. 
So and in Chinese, I can read for you. 大人吃大包子，小孩吃小包子 And then once this is splitting into four chunk, in this case, it could be more chunk if we keep going in this document. Now we're gonna take this chunk for this chunk to go to embed, embed, compute embed. So we're gonna use just first two chunk as example. We can do more for all the chunks in the for other document as well. So what we can do, I'll copy my word down here. This is the first two chunk. And by the way, if you're curious, this is character for big da. So it means big adult, big people, big people eat big dumplings. So that's why it means. So and then for this character, we're trying to compute first word embedding. So it's word embedding. So each word will correspond to some vector one one zero one zero. So they could be looked up or use some. Usually we looked up and found a pre-computed matrix. So in the vector database lecture I did earlier, I went into more detail. But for now, I just gonna give you the just that word embedding word become a embedding vector. So a single word become one one zero zero, another word become one zero zero one, and so on. And for the next chunk, similar process. So this this because it's the same character, you expect that the embedding vector is the same one one zero zero, which is the same as this one, all right. And then for now we have three of this, and we would like to merge them into just one. And then this we call sentence embedding over here, just one single vector. You go from three vectors to one single vector, and there are many operator we can use to combine them. And for the purpose of this illustration, I just use the simplest one, which is just summing up. So we sum them up. So this will be two. This is two. This is one. One. Two. Two. One. One. Sign. Sign. Uh, just summing up across the columns, and so this will do the same thing. So we'll get zero, three here, one here, and two here. So this first chunk with this embedding process, the result of embedding is get one single character vector two two one one. Similarly, for second chunk, another vector. Now we go to the last step to store them. To store them, we have this. Database is at least three columns, but can have potentially more columns. But minimally, three columns tend to work quite well for our purpose. And for first chunk, we'll store what is in the chunk. So this is actually the first these three characters. We're gonna put it down here, and now we have an embedding vector, which is this one. So two, two, one, one for this embed column. And for beta data, we're gonna go back all the way to the where the document came from. So the front. Go back to the document where the chunks came from. So in this case, is this ID and the date. So this ID supposed says this is a block article. So the ID is one, date is May ten, and for second chunk, so we have store the this three characters from here, and the embedding is zero three one two. And then the metadata actually because they even though they are different chunk they came from the same document they will share the same metadata here, document one, same date. So you keep come you will just keep continue this process to until until you put all the chunks. You can just visualize how many chunks they are. Four chunk document one, another four chunk from the second document, another four chunk from the third document. So at least in this example I have on this slide, we can expect to have. Four times three, twelve chunks over here. Of course, in real life application, you have hundreds of documents, if not over thousands of documents. So you could all the way go to like maybe ten k documents. And each document, instead of just four chunks, you could have ten chunks, twenty chunks, and thirty chunks, depending on your chunk size. And so this says we have uh one hundred chunks per document. So you can see all together will be one hundred. One hundred, about ten million. So they will be give you ten million rows in your vector database. Okay, so that's like in the production, you have that many rows to deal with, and you will have to probably use the database solution. Okay, so let's take a a a bit little talk about loading, uh, split and embed and store about this indexing process. Just a bit more, kind of. I want to show you some useful tool. You can use for this process and for the unloading part, and there are repositories such as like lum uh 
Nama Hub, they have a bunch of data loaders. You can ch choose from their own open source. For instance, you want to load data using CSV, you can look it up and say, oh, well, CSV reader, that's why I will use. And which loader to use, you want to read Word document, and they are, people have done that for you as well. So there's a docx reader, you might download that along with Llama index. If you use other tools, you have something similar. For instance, you use LinkChain, there's something similar. You can choose from lots of these read loaders already available you can use. And on the splitting part, and I would highlight the most important parameters you can control. The split process would be the chunk size and also the chunk overlap. So, and token text splitter is just an example of the library you can use to split your data. And I did it earlier just by hand, but in this is token text splitter would do exactly what I was doing, but this automatically. And chunk size four, I'm illustrate if you use this chunk size four, so we're gonna just, this one chunk, one, two, three, four, another four, another chunk, one, two, three, four, another chunk, one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So this token takes splitter, each word is the token and split, then become it's a chunk and it will fit to the embedding. And if we have an overlap of one, what does it, what does it mean? Let's use the different color. It means that, well, how are you doing? But for the next chunk, we're gonna repeat the last word, doing, Today, I hope. And for this chunk, there's over it one more. Hope you are doing. And then, and then next chunk. What is the next chunk? Doing well, whether you were. So have all that, you can deal with this boundary issue. Like some sentences cut into the into half. So you will never really learn the structure with full sentence, but with some overlap, you could cover this boundary slightly better. And there are some more intelligent methods for splitting, but in this case, I just want to highlight that, that what chunk size means, what overlap means. So this is the this is the example. And for embedding part, after you split them, you want to embed them. And the tool that's kind of helpful is you could that usually have a question. There's so many, it seems like there are tons of embeddings you can choose from. Where, how do you even begin? So one place you can begin is go to Hugging Face, Massive Text Embedding Benchmark. So you get this like massive table with all these embedding models. And so we could get all pretty much overwhelmed by this. But then just, I want to just give you some example, the process of selecting the embedding looks like. So for instance, well, I would like to know maybe save saving building, I've been hearing people using saving building parameter models. And so then you will go to this column to find, well, this is which model have seven billion parameters. And so the unit is million. So this is seven, seven B, seven B, not seven B. This is seven B, seven B. And then you, and then another seven B down here. So these are the meta llama seven B models or 7.5. It's close enough. So these are five candidates for seven B and you can see that in the next one is the memory usage. So memory usage is just proportional to the number of parameters. So this is 1B, this is a only four gigabytes, 7B has 26 gigabytes. So this, how you use this table to help you choose. And then, so if I ask you, which model has the most number of parameters? So again, we'll go into this column and find out this is huge, 46 billion parameters. And this is grid, large language model, eight times seven B. And you might ask, eight times seven is, what do you say times seven? 56, but it's over six. So this take home question for you to figure out why it's 46, not 56, all right? And which model support the longest context window? Which column do we have to look at if we like to know what how big the context window we'd like to fix? So that correspond to the chunk size. Earlier we we'll used three, so the context window just need to be three. But they now have a longest context window. So the, the, it turns out, this is the column you want to check. The context window is basically the number of tokens you can feed to the models. So which do you go down the list, which one has is longest? So you have this 32K, 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 32K. These are simply the longest, but that's a short. Also there are some shorter ones, 2K, 4K, 8K, and K. So you, if you really need low, Long, uh, really low, long context window, you pick this one, but not the other ones. And some other considerations like the actual downstream task for 
which model has the best classification performance, you will do that, go to this column. And so, well, it's classification average. So this one is highest and you use for this voyage in shock model. And if you would like to do a clustering performance, you check out this, all oh, this clustering task, go down, it's kind of close, but there's one, which one is highest? So this is slightly higher than the others. So you would use this GTE01, this is from, Ali, I believe from Alibaba, or I think from the Chinese model. And last, I would like to show you how to interpret this model. Go a bit deeper. You might see this diagram if you've been following my AI by hand series. So this is a transformer AI by hand example I have. So if you don't have, if this okay, you have not seen it, but you have. So this is the input. So I'd like to see that in the, with the two numbers. So this takes embedding three largest from open AI. So if you pick that one, so we have embedding dimension of this 3000 and max token of this. So where do this number correspond to this metric dimension? So 3000 correspond to this vertical dimension, like the length of how many rows we have down here for each column. So A1, A191 is correspond to here. So go this way horizontally. So in this case, we have five in this total example, but you could extend to A191 if you use this text embedding. And this example have three rows, but you can extend to 3000 for uh, if you use this embedding, but the transformer architecture is still the same metric publication, down, down, down attention and before network. Okay, this is probably the most technical slide I have here. And lastly, to store, you could use a resource like from Superlink, they publish a comparison of all the big database, vector databases and a bunch of columns. So we well, just as a practice, suppose I picked my embedding which is the embedding I just showed you, the text embedding from the open AI. If you remember the dimension is 3072. So if you look at this, they'll tell you these are unlimited. It's kind of okay, 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 okay. And this is 3000, okay. But please sign, this most likely designed for this embedding. So okay, okay. Now okay, if it's 2000, okay, okay. 4,000, okay, 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 now, okay. So you kind of use this as a, a good resource for you to choose as some other fields, like whether they provide sharding, how scalable they are, and so on. So that's how you choose a Vega database. So which database can fit 3,000 and 72 dimension? I just solved it in the previous slide. I should have do the exercise here. Anyway, and then lastly, we have, uh, after, so we finished the, uh, this stack. For index, we're gonna talk about retrieval. And for retrieval, if you use a database like single store, it provides very reliable storage. It could, if you are technical, you can write SQL statement to retrieve data from the database. You will say something like, what would be this X SQL statement, the pop quiz? You will do like select, select. And then this is a query that you already embed into, a, assuming we already embed into a vector zero to one, one, the fourth dimension. So this is a special symbol that single store support for you to compute embedding field and dot product with this. And dot product give you similarity. So we've ordered by the similarity score. So high score is good. So we'd like them to organize it descending order instead of ascending order. So you might vector, data, vector database lecture last time, I'll give a bit more details about this process, but, and you can also high level API such as super linked. So they hide a lot of complexity. If you are not comfortable with, comfortable with SQL, you can use the high level API. You will do something like uh, query design the query, give the index, and then we could just out. I want to find the post I want. And then based on similarity matrix. So I want it to be similar to my relevant, according to this particular space, for the parameter, I want to look for my comment field. And then when I actually run this, I just set the comment parameter to be my query string, how are you? And then we'll achieve the similar uh, effect of retrieving something. And once you retrieve, why do we want to retrieve it in the first place? Because we like that to be put into our template for rack time prompt, okay? Now, I, I, I guess I still have time, so I'm going to take you through a few advanced rack architecture and use uh, this drawing scheme I created, hopefully to help you 
but understand how React could evolve and support other up events application scenarios. So now I'm kind of going back to more like a review for a regular rack. And so suppose we have a user. When the user issue a query, so we'll go now go into here. Actually, I want to use a different color. Use the red, the user issue a query. And and if without rack, we'll just send this query directly to large language model and get our answer. And with rack, we'd like to augment this query with context. And the way to do that is we'll send the same query to our database. And the database is going to look up relevant documents. For instance, in this case, maybe document 21, document 43, document 39. These are the three relevant documents. And together with this prompt to tell large language model to be respectful, honest, and so on. And then at the end, we send this whole thing to our large language, large language model. And large language model hopefully can produce a much better answer to our user that would minimize the risk of hallucination. So let's review the, this component and you can see that. So what is each word R? Where do you see R? Where do you see retrieval? R is here, retrieval. Retrieval, we retrieve from our database. So this, this thing is retrieval. How about augment? Where do we see augmentation? So augmentation is this, this box. We augment, augment our query with a bunch of stuff. So from plus our context, uh, these three documents and query. So augmented with these two things. And then at the end, we use last language model to generate. Generate generation. So this is why we have rack equals prompt plus context plus query and plus LLM. So that's my that equation that help me understand what rack really is. Okay, so quick review of what rack is. And the one first one the one way we can in 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 uh imp extend this paradigm is when we send query, so this just a quick review, and then we retrieve down here. So what if we want to retrieve not just by one field, we can retrieve by multiple field, meaning multiple spaces. So we say we have one, we don't restrict, restrict by description field, and then we retrieve by headline and so on. Two instead of just one. And then we would like it to be something like, well, retrieve based on these two spaces that combine somehow, you can retrieve this document, like 21, and the rest is still the same. So this is the first extension I'd like to talk about for the multiple embedding spaces. And one way we could do this in a simple way is to use a library like Superlinked and they provide this library for vector compute. So I can kind of walk you through how it looks like. So start, still start with the query, like who, suppose someone went who won NBA. If you are, I'm actually, my hotel is just right next to Lakers Stadium in downtown. So I got to see, they already eliminated, so I don't see a lot of actions. But anyway, so I have this question. I can use this API's app.query, and this will be kind of, populated this query text field and a simple query defines how we like to query by different multiple fields. And what's important is where this weights 110, we're gonna talk about what this weight's gonna do. So this table, we have ID, this vector databases that follow the similar process I demonstrate to you, three column, but the four, and they're already embedded into this embedding. And with, with that, so what will happen is that then we'll take this query text, we use the same embedding model, and it will compute the embedding for this. So for instance, for first field will be one, two, three, four. So we'll just use any arbitrary number to represent that suppose this embedding give us zero, two, zero, three, say so embedding one. And then we use another embedding. This is all kind of, happen under the hood, this second embedding will give us another number. This second embedding has different number of dimensions, just so that to show you that it's possible to have different number of dimension. So second embedding maybe give us zero to zero. 
And the third thing is about time. So it's not embedding, but some kind of mathematical equation give us one one. They say, oh, we actually don't quite we want I like this to be older or something by time, by recency. Who won MBA? I'm talking about like this year, a season not over yet, or but last year. So this is a bit opportunity for to specify that. And if you've been following my AI by hand series, you know that for uh computing using this input vector to look up vectors from our database, the pro the, the mathematic operation is dot product. And to take dot product, we can do something this like this. 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 0, 3, multiply dot product with 0, 1, 1, 0. And for another one would be this, like this. And the third one will be use it like over here and then we'll compute this number. So this whole row and whole column we compute the dot product and we get this number. But hold on a minute. I just talked about we have this weight thing. So weight is that we're gonna put weight one one but zero. So if we put weight zero here it means I'm gonna ignore this one. We only had to pay attention to blue and yellow here. Anyway, so as a result when we compute this we get five here and three here, and six here. So this is a similarity based on dot product. And the higher the better, so six, in, in fact, this is how this number is. So it turns out this row is the most relevant and it will be shown in the result object. And output will use like two pandas to, will give you a data frame. Then you can do display, the data frame, then you'll be able to see your notebook. So this is a way you can implement the multi-dimension, I mean multi-embedding, in the adding multi-embedding to our, your rack. And then let's talk about some other uh, architecture I'm going to show you. For this uh, uh, rank GPT, the idea is that we we'll, we'll similarly we we'll start with a user and then we'll add, user will specify a query and then, and then you will use this query to go to the database to retrieve a bunch of relevant documents just as before. But we have this extra step before we send this to the LMM as is like before, we'll just take the whole thing with query. We're gonna ask LM, a, a, a first question is that, can you re-rank this document in a way that based on their relevance to the query. So we'll ask LM for this, not go previously we'll ask DB for this to retrieve the three document. We want the LM to recheck the result in this what it is. And LM going to say, well, this is our number one, this is our number two, this is our number three. So we rank this. And then it turns out if we do that, then we feed this re-ranked prompt back to the LM to really serve the query, we get much better result, less hallucination and so on. So this is a re-ranked GPT. And you can see that the actual prompt underneath you will be, will be saying something like, well, rank the passages about based on their relevance to the query. And then should be listed in descending or ascending. Again, so descending order going from the most similar high the score down, so descending, not ascending, and do not something. Also do not explain, because so we only ask them to re-rank. We, if we add this, that's just going to say a whole bunch of explanation sometimes, but but in this case, we are only we can only care about re-ranking. We're not asking it to make a single choice to justify, we just ask them to re-rank. So do not explain, because we're gonna use this result to feed back to the LAM and to get final answer. And in that case, it can explain more. Okay, so this rank GPT, you might have heard of multi-query retrieval. What does it even mean? Let's start again. We start with a user and then we send query to this, this. And then normally in the rack, we'll just send this query to the DB to get these three things. But instead of doing that, we're going to send this query now to the logic model, but not asking logic model to answer, but ask logic model say, hey, can you come up with some other query that kind of similar to this query and diversify the perspective? So we'll last one model give another query question, similar question, a derivative of this question, another question. And with this question, and it's going to then we send this up. Oh, so they send this question query to the database to get a bunch of documents. Send this query to the database, get a bunch of documents. 
and send this query to the database and get a bunch of documents. So you can expand it, the context from three documents to nine documents. Do you see that? And then with that, and we'll send, we send the whole thing, I want that purple, to the large language model and to get much better answer to this. So just multi-query retrieval. Hopefully that makes sense. And to implement multi-query -re retrieval is not super magical. It's just basically saying that you are the AI gen language model assistant, your task is generate two, in my previous case, two different ver versions of the given user question to retrieve relevant document from a vector database. And by generating multiple, and it tells you the purpose. Why do you want to generate two different versions? Because we want you to generate multiple perspective. So have a more diversity in our answer on the user question. Your goal is to help the user overcome some of the limitation of the similarity-based search. So we use only similarity-based search referring to the database part of it. It only uses similarity. It doesn't provide a lot of perspective at a high level. And with this case, it's multi-query retrieval to provide more diverse answers. And lastly, the last, uh, actually not lastly, a contextual compression is uh, another way to improve REG. So start with the user again, and but then we'll send the query, and then we'll generate. Normally, again, we normally will generate send query to database to get documents, and the query tend to be pretty short, short sentences, and then we have some keyword matching or, or or vector matching for database. And so, and then the contextual information, uh, compression is actually still send this to the database, get a whole bunch of query. And normally you send the whole thing to large language, uh, large language model and send this document in context as this. But for the contextual compression idea is that what if we, instead of sending the whole thing to large language model, because this document can be really long. The part that's really relevant to a query could be just a part of it. So the idea is what if we send the large language model this to see, check this document and query, and ask the language model, hey, can we just find the relevant part for each document, relevant part to query? So large language model will say, hey, for this document, this part is relevant. For this document, maybe this part is relevant. For this document, maybe this part is relevant. And then afterward, we just delete the rest of it that's not relevant. And then we use this compressed version of context and send this to large language model. And that could, it turns out to improve the preciseness of lots of answer to make language model more focused. And last is the hypothetical document embedding. The idea is that we start still start with the user as usual, and we send the query to here. And normally we'll send query to the database, but in, instead of doing that, we would like to say, hey, can I get a more extended form of the representation of query? And the form is we ask the query, large language model to look at the query to just, oh, how about you just guess what the answer would be? What the hypothetical answer? What would be the re relevant document look like? That's last language model to guess. So we call this thing a hypothetical document. And then we use this hypothetical document to query our database instead of the original query. And we get the relevant document. And the advantage of this is that the database has a lot more, so for instance, get 17, 23, 12. Database has a lot more keywords in your hypothetical document for you to look up relevant document. And with that, then we take the whole thing, augmented query again to large language model and get user, okay? All right, so um, I did succeed to cover everything I'd like to discuss today. I even went through a few advanced techniques for you to get a taste of and you, as you innovate, use more advanced techniques, really about some, just adding some change to this path of this a little bit, add something to it and reorder something. But then at the end of the day, a lot of times has to do with just modifying underlying prompt for you to do what you want. It's not super magical. Hopefully it you give a bit more idea what it is. Sorry for not leaving too much time for Q&A. Um, I'm done. Okay. Uh, we still have some more minutes for we can actually take a couple of questions if that's fine, Norm. Like, can we do that? Yes, yes. Okay. 
we have like a lot of questions. So uh, Nakul has asked, what are the good evaluation metrics to evaluate performance of racks? What's what's your thought on that? Uh, so I, I found the idea that I found pretty cool is that if you have a specific application in mind, you could actually ask a different language model, more objective to evaluate answer is, does it answer your question? So that's one way. And it will take the whole talk. I would, if there's enough interest, I would potentially develop a follow-up to about evaluation. I couldn't fit evaluation in today's like, presentation, but it's a really good question. Sounds good. Uh, we have another question from Manoj A. Uh, he says how the embeddings are indexed in vector database, how and how indexes are created and how do they work here? So how the index is in, so it depending on the, the database implementation. And so for something like single store, uh, so they would have a special data type called vector type. And they could, the reason is how, that nice about it is because it is become part of the, the SQL database. It works just seamlessly with what you already have in other regular columns. And so that's one way. And then also the other way, the other vendor that specifically develop a database, they have some kind of, um, representation, maybe use some some compressed version of a floating point to represent. And they might they might give you a really good performance if you only care about vectors. And so this is a trade-off you have to make. But if once you're mixing your metadata, date and stuff like that, it becomes difficult. Okay, okay. Uh we can take one more question before I announce the raffle winner. And guys, don't worry, we'll follow up with each one of you with the right answers via email. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we have one last question from Jordan. He says, can you explain the differences in index mappings for float byte and binary vector fields? Uh, if, For example, if this is a user defined parameter in database search settings, or is this a set, uh, or is this set by single store and other vendor providers and other open source tools? Uh, so for, that even theoretically, if you use the float byte and binary, it has to do with how, uh, what kind of quantization you want to make. So you could represent a uh, one uh, same data with 12, uh, 16 bits or 30 bits or four bits. And then of course, more bits you have, the like more fine grain detail you can capture, but then you, that is, as a, you have to, then, then you, you have to just pay for more storage. Single store is happy about that. But then if you just use fewer bits and then you could reduce the space complexity, but you might lose a little bit fine grained. But some application, it don't quite matter. For instance, there's only so many different var var variations for, for instance, age, how many different years of that could a human have versus that like a uh, stock prices that is a, they would require a more bits to represent. Hopefully okay. It makes sense. okay. Uh, thank you so much for answering these questions so patiently. <laughs> thank you for uh, hosting us, hosting me, and uh, I got a wonderful audience. Oh Hopefully, it's I'll see you again. Oh, absolutely! We are so excited about it. Uh, guys, uh, just for you guys, if you want to try a uh, single store, we have actually six hundred dollars of free uh credits that we offer and. Actually, personally, I have used single store like many times and I still have those. It's been almost eight months and like since I've joined and like I still have those credits. So if you guys want to play around, like definitely go and try it. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Tom. It was thank such you. a pleasure. And uh, uh, thank you, Akmal, for answering all the questions so well. Uh, so quick notes before I announce today's raffle winner. Akmal, can I please see the slides uh, for, for the next webinars? Uh, yes, so let me see. Uh, um, Tom, could you just uh, stop sharing for that for a moment, please? Yes. Thank you very much, sir. And let me just uh, see if I can do that. Um, bring this up. Uh, okay. <laughs> now what I need to do is to find oh. the, the appropriate <laughs> page. <laughs> Too many oh. windows open. Uh, let's have a look. Bear with me one moment. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There uh, we go. Okay, I think I've got it. Uh, just 
it. Yeah, that should do it. Okay, and I think your page you're looking for is this one and this one, is it? Yes, is the that previous one. one. That um, one. Okay, there absolutely. you Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so, guys, quick notes before I announce today's raffle winner. We have some amazing sessions that are coming up. I'll hope to see like a lot of you over there uh, on May 17th, which is a very hot topic. Or GPT 4.0 for developers, hands-on with OpenAI Spring release. Uh, you can find everything on your slide. And on May 20th, we have how to build local LLM apps with Olama and Single Store for Mac security. We will have Akmal as the speaker, so it Yay. should be fun. Uh, <laughs> And on May 22nd, we have LLMs in fraud detection. Everything is on your screen. Please RSVP right now. I'll hope to, uh, to see you guys there. So the announcement everyone's been waiting for today's raffle winner. We uh, are giving the raffle winner to, uh, let me just- To me. Out. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. No, I'm not eligible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we are giving the raffle winner to Nadir Abilil Sadik. Uh, he is a lead software engineering architect at North Northville Health. Congratulations! Oh, congrats! Uh, yeah, uh, you can choose the prize that whatever you want, and our team will definitely get in touch with you. If this is not you, please do not give up. You, we will also announce another winner by the end of the day for anyone who tries out today's demo. Please sign up at this link and just try our notebooks. Anything is fine. Uh, just you guys will be eligible uh, to and be entered to win. Big thank you to Tom for taking out his time and uh, you know spending time with us and explaining everything so well we really value your time and energy and thank you guys for such a good response and have a great rest of the day Take thank care, you everyone. bye bye bye, bye everyone